because three months. Officer, and he was very good in Maskirovka, but he was very bad in, you know, reconnaissance, you know. Uh, Can you hear me? Great. John Keen, one of the most outstanding thinkers of today's world and the author of a splendid book on new despotism. I think that Liberty Library will be publishing the book as soon as possible. A brief introduction. John requested me to ask the fewest possible number of questions so that you can ask your questions. A brief introduction. Three days after the war in Ukraine started, I talked to one of the most outstanding people of strategy, Lawrence Friedman, the author of the common book. Contrary to what everybody was saying, After three days of war, contrary to what everybody was saying, he said that Putin would lose the war. That Putin is counterintelligence uh, officer. He is accustomed to Maskirovka without knowing what's happening actually in the field. In order to win any war, you need to have good, um, knowledge of what is field. Your wonderful book is most probably the best image of what our enemy is. <clears throat> this huge anti-democratic movement that covers a huge part of the world, from Hungary to China, from Uzbekistan to Russia, from Saudi Arabia to Yemen. We keep thinking. We pause, keep thinking that the battle will be easy, that enemy will collapse tomorrow after the day, the day after tomorrow, because there'll be inflation surge, another corruption scam, another prime minister or minister, whoever, turns out to be an idiot. And what happens? There is yet another corruption scam or scandal. Another prime minister is a liar and an idiot. And still, we are ruled by somebody else. And John explains one thing. The system that he calls new despotism is much more resilient to any shocks, much more intelligent, much better developed than we tend to think. 
because we keep thinking democracy that is something resilient to shocks non-democratic systems are not resilient in this respect but we can see that they are shock resistant much more than democracy let's see what is happening in russia we keep saying putin is going to lose uh, the battle in donbass huge sanctions against putin putin will collapse and nothing of this kind is happening therefore you're invited to read the book by professor keen new despotism and i'd like to express my gratitude for his presence and welcome our guest with a round of applause thank you very much the first question normally when we talk about something that is not democracy, non-democratic systems in today's world, we use different terminology. We speak about liberal democracy, authoritarianism. In your book, you use different words, new despotism. Why new despotism? Why is this so important to give it a different name? It was a pani panovi jin dobre. I think that the remarks of George Orwell that in politics language counts. I mean, the words that we use are important for shaping how we see the world. And this book is, in this respect, an attempt to uh, suggest a different language, a different way of thinking about the biggest 21st century threat to power sharing, constitutional, uh, monetary democracy, as I call it. Regime, this book is um, a comparison of regimes. It doesn't suppose that all dogs are Dalmatians, that all of these regimes are the same. It is a study of, uh, with jokes, with details of regimes as different as Saudi Arabia, Vietnam, China, Russia, Turkey, Orbán's Hungary, Singapore, and so on. These are regimes that in our times by journalists and politicians and others are called autocratic, you know, a single ruler. This is a misunderstanding of how these regimes work. Yes, there is a strong man ruler, but that strong man is embedded in a whole system of patronage, of corruption, of clientelism. Sometimes they are called tyrannies, but technically, a tyranny is a regime where everybody is afraid and there is great disorder. These regimes tend not to be like this. They are not totalitarian regimes. They are not old-fashioned military dictatorships. They are not authoritarian regimes in the technical sense of the term that an authoritarian regime is one which rules by the fist and doesn't have elections. No, these are regimes that are clever, they are threatening of power-sharing democracy, and in this book, I try to, revi to revive an old word that was used, for example, by Leszek Kolokowski, one of your great thinkers. Mm -hmm. He used the word despotism a lot. It was a word that flourished in Europe in the second half of the 18th century and in the 19th century, and then died out. What is a despotism? Well, a despotism, yes, is top-down rule. It is a system of power in which wealth um, is concentrated at the top. Uh, it's, these are what the Hungarians call a form of, uh, of polygarchy. They are systems in which the rulers constantly speak about people, the people. They are what I call in the book phantom democracies. They are systems in which there are middle classes, sometimes big. In China, four to 500 million people think of themselves as middle class and they are loyal. 
They are not in favor of liberal democracy. These are regimes uh, in which there is clever use of media. These are regimes in which there isn't widespread fear. These are regimes that carefully target violence. If you oppose the regime, it cracks down very hard on you, as we know from the protests recently in a string of protests in, in Russia. The rulers follow the Chinese proverb. You kill a chicken to scare the monkeys. Uh, this, uh, and one last thing, these are regimes that have learning mechanisms built into them. The rulers are nervous. They are afraid that people will uh, cause trouble. And so there is a kind of watching of the population, a learning mechanisms. Elections are one such example. With very few exceptions, Brunei, partly in Saudi, all of these despotisms practice elections. All of them, the rulers rely upon public opinion polling. They have, uh, in the United Arab Emirates, they have happiness forums, you know, at all levels, forums where people are encouraged to say, I am not happy with this or that. Um, the most sophisticated uh, probably is the uh, regime of Xi Jinping. It is, of course, emerging as a global empire. It is the one that will help shape the future of despotism. So this book is an attempt to change the language uh, of, uh, for the way we understand these regimes. These are not regimes that are ruled through the fist. These are not regimes in which Putin and Xi decides everything arbitrarily. It's more complicated. And these are regimes that have a kind of cleverness about them. These are regimes in which what I call voluntary servitude flourishes. People are loyal. They grumble. They mm. bellyache. Uh, you know, uh, there is a Russian joke that what is Putinism? Uh, it's two packets of cigarettes a day and a liter of vodka. Mm. Yeah, there are these jokes. But... Um, the regimes try to create a loyalty. And this is a great paradox, that a regime of concentrated power, top to bottom, hierarchical, produces loyalty. This is despotism, and this is the old meaning of despotism in the 18th century. I tried to revive this term to make sense of regimes that will be with us uh, for the foreseeable future, and the warning in this book is that we should learn uh, better to understand how they operate in order politically to weaken and defeat them. Okay, thank you very much, John. So the question is, uh, we in Poland, and not only in Poland, when thinking about this new, before your book, we called it autocratic tendencies. We used to think in categories of thirties, you know, Hitler, Mussolini, so on. We have this book everybody here, almost everybody read, you know, about Tim Snyder on tyranny. And the question we are asking all the time is, oh, is Orban, Trump, Kaczynski or anybody Putin kind of new Hitler? Now, our most obvious candidate for new Hitler is Putin. But what's the difference? What's new if we compare it with Fertis? It's, it's in the beginning of your book, and it was brilliant. Yeah. OK, so uh, again, words matter in politics. Words matter for the way we see the world. And if we use the word fascist, or totalitarian to describe these regimes, we need to be clear about the meaning of these words. Um, here, I would quote to you Hannah Arendt, one of the great political thinkers of the 20th century, German-Jewish, um, who I think correctly wrote and said many times that fascism, totalitarian rule, is a type of rule where there is one party, dominant. It is a type of rule where terror is spread through the population. 
It is a type of rule in which the people are mobilized, mm -hmm. you know, in big rallies. These despotisms, by the way, do not produce total terror. They do not uh, want mass mobilizations. They have rallies. Orban does it. Uh, she occasionally does it. But they would rather that people busy themselves with private life, family, job, drinking, dining, going on holidays, to be not political animals. And finally, fascism was a form of rule in which there is a total ideology which, is, which tries to be comprehensive. One of the um, strangest things about these despotisms is the way the rulers at all levels wear a coat of many colors. You know, I give you an example. Um, today is Sunday. Xi Jinping can give a speech about socialism and the future uh, will be socialist. On Monday, he gives a speech about ecological civilization as if it's written by Greenpeace. On Tuesday, he speaks about ancient Chinese civilization, 5,000 years old. On Wednesday, he speaks about markets and market reform. Uh, you know, this doesn't, this doesn't add up. It's a kind of um, uh, potpourri. It's a kind of uh, eclectic language, very different and cleverer than the fascist language because it allows the rulers to, uh, to uh, travel with the winds. They can, they can be green, they can be socialist, they can be, they can be ancient, you know, defenders of uh, the old empire, etc. And it's much more difficult to combat them. So for these reasons, Mati, I think that um, it's a misdescription to describe them as uh, totalitarian. We will see whether, I know in Poland there is a discussion, we will see whether Putin's Russia degenerates into this where there will be mass mobilization, where there will be the spread of terror uh, to, uh, totally, where there will be a coherent ideology of, you know, great Russian empire mm -hmm. um, with a tremendous amount of, of violence. We are going to see whether this happens. But do not speak of China or Saudi Arabia or Vietnam or Turkey or the Central Asian Republics as fascist. This is, this is a misdescription. I mean, the word fascist in English, you know, it, it, it sometimes gives us a good feeling, call mm -hmm. someone a fascist, you know. But this is not, I think, an accurate term, and it, uh, it misleads us. Mm -hmm. um, it, it doesn't, it's not helpful in understanding why these regimes reproduce themselves and maybe why they have a durability. Mm -hmm. So I'm run of my time but the last one. Uh, okay, so we are, every day, you are thinking they will collapse. As we say, they are not collapsing. What is the most important factor for the resilience? What, why they are not collapsing? Why Erdogan, with 80% of inflation, is still in power? Uh, so we are on 20% inflation in Poland, so we have to wait many, many years b before 80. But as, uh, as we see, 80 is not enough. I think the question is of fundamental importance. And here uh, I would say that uh, we need to pay attention to the, uh -huh. if you like, the dialectics, the the the... The, the several sides of the dynamics. On the one hand, the reason for, ultimately, key reason for durability is cleverness of those who rule. They are foxes and they are lions and they are backed by public opinion polling uh, data. They have elections, they have learning mechanisms built in, including digital. Uh, learning mechanisms. The Chinese uh, are masters of, of this art. They learn about citizens who are pissed off with the regime. And they uh, mm. often they will remove people from power uh, as corrupt, put them in prison because there has been some 
public output. So on the one hand, the, the ultimate source of durability, despite economic problems of inflation or unemployment, despite problems like the aging of the population, this is a serious question for uh, the Chinese, uh, despite strains on social welfare systems, remember these regimes uh, deliver a lot of patronage. It's estimated that at least 50% of the Russian population, their daily lives are dependent upon state spending. And in China, it is uh, much the same trend. Extension of pension systems, healthcare, education, tremendous expense. So, on the one hand, uh, I mean, cleverness, uh, built-in learning mechanisms, early warning detectors. They know that concentrated power can be foolish, that it can make serious mistakes, and the regime can be jeopardized. But on the other, these are phantom democracies. Uh, there is no open scrutiny of power. There is the civil societies are very weak in all of these uh, regimes. And this is their greatest weakness. And we are going to see whether, for example, launching a war driven by imperial nostalgia, launching a war um, on Ukraine and possibly widening that war is a serious foolish mistake that was not checked by uh, accountability mechanisms a foolish mistake that actually jeopardizes uh, the whole regime. We are going to see this. The Chinese understand this problem very well, and um, I think that, uh, again, we will see which side, so to say, prevails in this. I, I have no crystal ball. You have no, uh, we are not gods. We don't know what will happen. Uh, Adam Miknik warned many years ago <laughs> that surprise is one of the great factors in, in politics. And this rule also applies to these new despotisms, I think. Okay. Uh, John Prosiu, John requested me to leave 30 minutes for questions. I have 24 minutes, a bit less, so your questions. I don't know who is the microphone master here. There's a lady. Good morning. So very pleased to be able to ask a question. Thank you very much for this conversation. It's wonderful to see your power of knowledge integration. I read China 5.0 book and I think about digital revolution having the greatest impact upon people. Digital revolution comes in aid to manage emotions and this is much more powerful than pure intellect so i'm wondering do you have any idea what can be surprising for those what what can be surprising for these despotic people what is uh, the challenge what is the solution of this riddle what kind of surprise can we prepare for them and jinghui it's about so it's a it's a lovely question because all of these regimes are um, embedded in an infrastructure of digital network communications. You know, in a way, they are products uh, of this unfinished communications revolution, which is, which is going on. And the pattern that I describe in the book is fairly clear. On the one hand, there is an attempt centrally to control digital network platforms. So um, every day through the main television and newspapers and uh, online platforms, the regime pumps out uh, quite sophisticated um, what was called propaganda. I mean, messaging is constant. It's 24-7. And it reaches the mobile phones of the population. In a way, despotic power runs deeper uh, than previous uh, regimes. It comes into the everyday lives of people. And 
regimes, the most sophisticated are probably Iran and uh, China, followed maybe by Vietnam, uh, certainly Singapore. These regimes are very clever in the way that they try through the state to control the, um, this communications revolution. But there is another uh, side. Uh, there is a, another dimension of this trend, and it is what I call in the book digital mutinies. They happen every day. So online, typically, um, a local community or a group of young people or somewhere in, uh, in some institution complain. They take, uh, they take a small video or they, take, uh, they do screenshots and they expose the corruption or the stupidity, the folly of the regime. And sometimes these digital mutinies, I don't know if this translates easily into Polish, you know, when there is a, a rebellion, this happens, it's chronic. Every day in China, um, there are thousands of these. Th this is not a totalitarian regime where everybody is loyal and is afraid to speak out. People do speak out. Um, sometimes these um, mutinies develop, we say in English, legs. One is going on in Iran right now. Uh, yes. Uh, you know, if you look at the city of Shanghai, 25 million people, um, during the last year of COVID, a lot of belly aching uh, of people complaining that the party is turning COVID into a political matter. You are locking us in our apartments. We want out, etc. So um, there is a kind of cat and mouse game that goes on constantly. We don't know whether there will be a big one. Uh, the last big one in China, I am at the moment with a Chinese colleague finishing a new book on the rise of this new Chinese empire. The last big one was a um, child vaccine scandal in, in 2017, 2018. So uh, several companies are manufacturing vaccines for children that are false. And a journalist finds it out, sends on WeChat and Weibo and other means that there is a corruption problem here. It was so intense that she was traveling in uh, Rwanda and he suspended his schedule to give a press conference to say that corruption will not be tolerated in China. And they arrest a load of people and th th there is an end to this. How did that happen? Because there was a digital mutiny of people. So uh, these are, the, th this dynamic needs to be understood. Um, in this respect, those who rule find it much more difficult to rule than in the era of broadcasting. You know, the era of radio, Bertolt Brecht said, you know, the microphone is, is the tool of fascism. It is right. And much more difficult than centralized television uh, and centralized control of newspapers. This, because it's distributed, it's networked, uh, it, can, it can produce reversals of, of power. These happen chronically. And sometimes, as I say, they are deeply threatening of these regimes. Britannia? Thank you for coming to Warsaw at Poland. Uh, to watch. <laughs> uh, so I have uh, two questions. Uh, first is the actually about Russia. Uh, so looking on what's happening right now of the lack of ability people to speak, uh, against the war, the fear of hundreds of thousands of people escaping Russia from mobilization, the terror that actually is imposed on normal people, especially Moscow and St. Petersburg right now. Do you think that Russia already not passed the point of being a total, fully totalitarian country where one, either the elites are murdered by Putin, where his decisions are basically probably one person decisions, uh, so, in your mind, I actually passed the threshold of being called totalitarian when you have that power. And second question, um, 
when you look at the totalitarian regimes, um, they have full power until they don't. Like, for example, Egypt or um, Libya. So what are the signs of the regime uh, that is failing, the, the structure that's built is actually start to cracking and failing. What are the signs that might not may be easy to spot from outsiders? Thank you. Start with the second. Very good questions. Uh, the second, the, the sign uh, of uh, the crumbling of power is the, it's very old fashioned to speak about this, but once upon a time in Poland, you spoke all the time about civil society. I think that you know, the emergence of a civil society, a plurality of groups networked, cooperating non-violently, showing that um, there is a kind of, yeah, mots bez motznik, you know, the, that there is power of the powerless. This is the, the, the key indicator of whether the regime is uh, threatened. It may be, first question, um, I, mean, I, I don't know, and I'm no Russian expert, uh, once again, I repeat that um, there, is, there is this cleverness about the Putin regime. Uh, there is, it seems, an unwillingness to murder at the top. I mean, they learned the, the rules of Khrushchev, that you don't murder your opponents because then nobody is safe. Uh, there are other ways of getting rid of people fake corruption charges, imprisonment, ask Alexei Navalny. Uh, but we are going to see whether um, there is the capacity for uh, declaring the need for some serious peace negotiations or whether uh, there will be some at least partial withdrawal and cessation of military. I don't know whether this is possible. My expectation is from the outside. I live in the Southern Hemisphere near Antarctica. What do I know? But my sense is that this war will drag on. Uh, what would change things is the use of nuclear or bioweapons. Then, then, then we have another dynamic, I think. Um, but it is, you are right, uh, that it is one of the great questions of our moment. And you have the misfortune of living right on the edge of this. Did you expect me to predict the downfall of Putin? I, I, I wish. Mm -hmm. But you. Mm, well, so, John, if I can ask you, uh, when we were when we were talking during the breakfast, you told very interesting thing about China. Can you repeat some of them? You know, so how China will react to this war? Because it was it was really illuminating. Because you are, as you told, you are from Australia, and and and, and, about, and and you are and you we Poles we know something about Russia, but we know exactly nothing about China and. Maybe China is even bigger question than, uh, than Russia today. Sure. Uh, I mean, I live 60% mm -hmm. of the exports of mm -hmm. my country go to China. And uh, uh, we have a million and uh, nearly a million and a half Chinese people who live in Australia, et cetera, et cetera. My university would collapse financially if it wasn't for Chinese students. Um, about this moment, m my interpretation of the, all of the complexities, put simply, is that this is quite a good period for Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, it's clear that the United States is now heavily uh, implicated in a proxy war uh, in Ukraine, and it could widen. Uh, and so the United States is tied down uh, in Europe. Uh, as you know, last uh, week, um, the Biden administration announced a second war. So they will confront China uh, in the matter of superconductors. We will have a superconductor war. And as you know, uh, most superconductors are produced in uh, Taiwan. Uh, there is the building of superconductor factories going on in various places, Korea and the United States. So the Chinese, um, the Chinese are look at this period as one in which the United States is preoccupied 
and China will wait. It will wait, and it will not. It will not um, declare interests. Uh, it's, it will not declare open support like India doesn't declare open support for for uh, Putin. The other benefit of this period is that um, the People's Liberation Army uh, generals and the military advisors and the diplomats learn how not uh, to launch war and make stupid mistakes. You know, they learn how not to do it. Mm. Of course, um, most journalists in the United States, many politicians are predicting that this is the moment where war will come to, uh, to Taiwan. We are going to see. The Chinese method, by the way, it's one of the basic principles of this uh, regime, is to try to win a war without firing a shot. This is a famous phrase of Sun Tzu. Uh, and this is a phrase that is used uh, widely. War, from the Chinese perspective, has already begun. It's a war in Ukraine. It's a war on, concerning superconductors. There is a lot of heated words. There are diplomatic pressures. There are attempts to, uh, to, to restrict imports and exports. So for the Chinese, the war has begun. For the moment, they wait. They wait. And uh, well, we are going to see how uh, the leadership handles this, uh, this new dynamic. Um, there is one other thing to say. Xi in Samarkand, a couple of months, nearly a couple of months ago, told uh, Putin that the Chinese have concerns about this war. I mean, um, Putin, uh, there is a Chinese expression, uh, Putin, you know, is a pain in the ass for Beijing. Uh, and so the Chinese stay out of this, you know, this, this war as the Indians do. Behind the scenes, do they send weaponry to Russia? Uh, there is no evidence of this, but they do. The Chinese do um, prop up the Russian banking system uh, and continue behind the scenes diplomatically uh, to no doubt advise uh, Putin's regime uh, about how to get out of this uh, mess. The collapse of Russia would be a, a disaster for, for China. Mm -hmm. So um, what I say is not a defense of, of Xi Jinping. It is an attempt to describe um, at the moment why it is that the Chinese do not speak in favor of uh, the war and why they do not speak against the war. Thank you very much. So, yes, uh, Britannia? It's about China. Don't you think that the previous system in China, in which there were rotation every 10 years in a uh, ruling team, was much more resilient and somehow efficient than current uh, Xi Jinping uh, authoritarian, in effect, autocratic uh, system? And at least uh, the single leader uh, can create strong. Uh, uh, trend toward uh, autocratic system. Um, once again, uh, here I am, I mean, not fully in agreement. Here, I, here I, I am playing the bad boy again because it seems to me that the Western fixation on uh, Xi as an autocrat, someone who uh, will get his uh, another 10 years, uh, who will dominate the Politburo. That way of thinking forgets that this system is a multi-layered system of power, one of whose secrets 
learning from the Soviet Union's mistakes, one of whose secrets is the decentration of power, especially to the local level, to the municipal level, and so on. It's all party controlled, but it's a system that has within it a lot of shock absorbers. Uh, and of course there is corruption at all levels, but this is a system that I think should not be understood as you know, single autocratic rule or tire, tyrannical rule by one leader. It, this is not the way the system works. And you will find um, at the uh, central committee level and at the uh, uh, institutions underneath this, the uh, people's consultative councils and so on, all the way down, you will find that there is um, at least a measure of satisfaction that there is stability in China. I mean, one of the great things about the Trump period and now the Biden period for the Chinese is you know, why would you want an electoral democracy of this kind? It produces you know, shit leaders and it produces chaos and confusion. We have you know, a source of stability and stability um, and trust in the leader is hugely important. There is, uh, in the last year, signs of a lot of grumbling against Xi. Jokes. Um, but we will see in the next few weeks uh, the outcome. Whether there will be a, a compromise at the very top to renew uh, reform and loosening we are going to see. I mean, it's very hard to read the tea leaves just at this moment. Um, the question is whether China can keep its borders closed, it, 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 can, it can dampen and control uh, the large corporations like Huawei or Alibaba, uh, whether it can continue to lock down cities several dozen at this moment, as I speak, are locked down. You know, can this model continue? Well, I'm sure in the, uh, up towards the Politburo, the view, there are views that this cannot, there will have to be a kind of opening. So bottom line is, you know, look underneath the surface of, of Xi Jinping, look at what goes on in these, uh, in the lower levels of the regime and remember that it's my idea that if you look at Chinese power in the world, what is emerging is uh, a new empire. It is an empire um, which has tremendous financial power, which has huge corporations like Costco, which is a very big shipping uh, 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 state-owned enterprise that Europe is integrated with. Uh, the Chinese, uh, have in the last 10 years replaced GPS with their own a digital uh, satellite tracking system, Baidou, it's called the Big Dipper. They are doing deals not in US dollars but in renminbi. I mean, in every continent, including Antarctica, there are signs of the spread of Chinese power. And this is, uh, you can't use this word in China yet, but this is a, a de guo, this is an empire. And it's an empire of a kind we've never seen before. Xi uh, is, uh, yes, emperor, but he is uh, an emperor of a very complicated polity which, which is expanding uh, globally. This must be understood, it seems to me. Don't, oh, wait, we have two minutes, so. Uh, Please, take as many. So, uh, very short question, and a very short answer. Yes. Mm. Take several. So, but wait, we have only two minutes. No, no, no. Okay. Cool. okay, so, everybody? A very short question on Iran, if I may. You've mentioned that reading the public opinion as an important pan part of these regimes to stay in power. It seems now that a significant part of the Iranian society goes against the very core of the regime being the Islamic Republic. Do you think there is any room for maneuver given also that it's a very young part of the society that's not rebelling against the core values of the system?
uh, time for a joke, uh, you may not know, but in 2009, there was a similar situation uh, where there was a disputed election and um, there was a big crackdown as there is now, much violence. Uh, as I explained, there are moments when these despotisms become very violent. And it was in this period that I was, uh, so many people were arrested, scholars, journalists, and in the opening morning of the trial to prosecute and send to prison these people, I was named with Jürgen Habermas and Richard Rorty, two intellectuals, as the masterminds of the, of the counter-revolution. Uh, it was news to me, and I was accused of being MI5, MI6, and CIA agent. And my joke is I never got paid uh, for this. Mm -hmm. So um, this is another very serious uh, situation. Um, who is driving this? Uh, who are the, what is the social support for this resistance? Young people, women, um, parts of the middle class, certain regions uh, of Iran that feel uh, discriminated against, and a general sense that this is a corrupt regime in which uh, cost of living becomes unbearable for many uh, people, in which the dignity of, uh, of, uh, of pe many people is being destroyed. We are going to see how um, resilient this regime is. Uh, this is to, be, is to be watched, it seems to me. And the defeat of this regime would be something of uh, great significance. Um, do not underestimate, however, its resilience. You know, it, it, it has a military force which is also in business. And millions of Iranians' lives are dependent upon this revolutionary guard system. Again, it's patronage, it's clientelism. And don't underestimate the, the, the ability of the regime to project messages through the internet. There is a two-tiered internet in Iran. Um, it's, uh, there are blackouts at the moment. It's very difficult. But, well, we are going to see. In this respect, the 1979 revolution is not finished. This is, a, this is part of an unfinished dynamic, it seems to me. What role do other despotisms play? We should pay attention to this. One of the features we discussed already is that these new despotisms hunt in packs. I mean, the Chinese and the Iranians have been advising uh, each other about internet controls, for example. Uh, Chinese loans to the banking system of Iran. Uh, weaponry coming in from Russia and other sources. This should also not be underestimated. And it may be that this Iranian dynamic becomes a kind of Belarus dynamic, you know, tremendous growth of a civil society and protests and so on. But in the end, people grow tired and force decides mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, it produces a kind of false stability of the, the regime. We will see. Niestety, tak jak było. As we could foresee, 45 minutes. Ask, you know, so many questions. I can only say uh, there are two kinds of books. Books you read because you want to confirm your uh, opinions and other very rare, rare kinds of books when you discover something. So I can only say everybody should read John books and especially for me. So new despotism is kind of masterpiece. I hope it will be published in Poland and we should say thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. It's not always easy to recognize. It may look like this, or like this. It may be a burden, but it is a responsibility that we embrace nonetheless. But if it means this for one person and this for someone else, 
Maybe it ultimately means being there for one another. It isn't handed to us, but we know where to find it and how it feels, how it tastes and what it sounds like when we finally have it. It means different things to different people, but for many it means everything. And if we all fight for it, it will eventually bring us together. Atlas Network is, as the name suggests, a network and it's global. We work all around the world. We're based in the U.S. We have about 159 partners in uh, the United States right now. And the bulk of our partners are outside, nearly 500 in total. Atlas Network, it connects people uh, from all over the world, defending the idea of uh, human dignity, uh, defending human rights and personal liberties. Atlas Network is focusing on, I think, the most important and moral cause in the entire world. We partner with local innovators, local leaders who understand conditions on the ground in communities facing real challenges. We look at the people from the worldwide freedom movement that are passionate, are ready to make a difference, understand local conditions, and we invest in them. At Atlas Network, we unleash individual ingenuity to enrich humanity. The United States does not have a lock on the idea of freedom and liberty. Those ideas are beyond borders. One of the main goals of Atlas Network is to eradicate poverty around the world. And we do that by investing millions of dollars in our partners' work every year. 
Historically, uh, wealthy nations around the world have tried to help low-income countries develop. The way we've been doing it traditionally has not really been working. So there's a movement to do development differently, and that means we need to step back as outsiders and rethink the role that we're playing in helping people in low-income countries achieve their dreams. We want to make the world a better place. We want to make the world a freer world. All of us want to leave a legacy and be part of something big to make a better world. This is exactly the work of Atlas Network. With our growing number of hundreds of successful partners, we're stronger than ever. Changing the world. Changing the world. Changing the world. Starts together with, with us. us.